Introducing NASM One, NASM's ultimate membership program. Unlock access to everything your fitness career needs to succeed. Unlimited CEUs, free courses, access to our premium app, and exclusive discounts. All for thirty-five dollars a month. NASM One is best-in-class tools, cutting-edge certifications, confidence in your craft, and everything you do as a personal trainer made easy, so we can achieve our greatest goals together as one. You're listening to the NASM CPT podcast with Rick Ritchie, winner of the Share Care Emmy Award for social storytelling, and the official podcast of the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Hey, y'all, and welcome to the NASM CPT podcast. My name is Rick Ritchie, and today we're going to, it's kind of like a quiz day today. I'm going to I'm gonna ask you questions and see if you can figure out some things about the shoulder. We're going to be doing anatomy of the shoulder, identifying what muscles move the shoulder joint. Now, this is the shoulder joint, the glenohumeral joint, and it is not shoulder girdle, which would include also the movement of the scapula and the uh, uh, clavicle. So some of this information I'm getting from anatomy, shoulder and upper limb, glenohumeral joint by Chang, Anand, and Varakalo. And this was last updated August 8th, 2023. This is not exhaustive. This is not an exhaustive list of what the muscles do. So in there, and just letting Chang, uh, Anand, and Varakalo know that I will also be adding some things to this, and it still won't be exhaustive, but let's discuss it. So here they say the glenohumeral joint possesses the capability of allowing an extreme range of motion in multiple planes. Well, the first uh, range of motion we're going to talk about, and we talked about this a little bit uh, a week or so ago, but it included scapular movement. But let's have a conversation about the movers of the glenohumeral joint. Gleno is the glenoid fossa, which is that hollowed out fossa or area where the scapula is uh, or the shoulder blade. And gleno is the, uh, uh, the humeral is the head of the humerus and where those two bones come together to create a joint, glenohumeral joint. And so at that joint, there's flexion and extension. So first let's talk about flexion, muscles that move the shoulder. Let's talk about flexion. So in this flexion is uh, defined as the decrease in angle between two bones around the joint. It's when we bring the upper arm anterior in front of the body and even overhead in the sagittal plane. So that typical range of motion is 180 degrees. And this is what they say in the paper, but we know based off of the conversation we had last week or the week before, 120 is from flexion at the glenohumeral joint. The other 60 typically will come from the upward rotation of the scapula. So not 180 degrees from the glenohumeral joint. And that's important to point out, uh, at least in my perspective, maybe not in the authors of this paper. Uh, The main flexors of the shoulder are going to be the anterior deltoid, the coracobrachialis, not a big muscle, but it's very supportive here, and the pectoralis major. And we could very much say if we said anterior deltoid, we can also say specifically upper pecs. So the upper pecs, the pecs that have the angle of movement that go onto the the clavicle, those are going to be a larger producer of flexion in the sagittal plane. Also, they point out, and I agree, the biceps brachii weakly assist the action of flexion at the shoulder joint. So that's flexion. That's flexion. One more time, shoulder flexors, anterior delts, coracobrachialis, pectoralis major, the biceps brachii. Um, And that would be because both the short and the long head of the biceps brachii, the biceps in your arm, uh, cross over the shoulder joint. So that's shoulder flexion. Shoulder extension is defined as the increase in angle between two bones around a joint. That's when we bring the upper arm down or posterior in the sagittal plane. 
Now, the range of motion there is going to be somewhere between 45 and 60 degrees of extension. So as you pull the arm back, the elbow is by your side. You just keep moving it backwards, and you're going to get about 45 to 60 degrees. But, but I also will point out that a, a significant portion of that, a not inconsequential portion of that, would be from the and uh, the elevation and anterior tipping of the scapula. So even though we're talking about glenohumeral movement, when we say 45 to 60 degrees, then that isn't without the, um, the addition of the other joint action. Now, if you pin the scapula, and you pull the elbow back and you get about 45 degrees, then that would be glenohumeral extension. But the other, the additional component of that would be because the scapula is moving. Now, the main extensors of the shoulder are going to be, we could say, posterior deltoid, certainly not as strong as the, uh, the latissimus dorsi, so the lats. And then the teres major is also a pretty strong extensor. In fact, the teres major, you may be familiar, is known as the lat's little brother. Anything that the lats do at the shoulder joint, not at the uh, low back or along the spine, because the teres major does not connect to them, but it does connect the shoulder blade to the arm, so it, the scapula to the humerus. Anything the lats do at the glenohumeral joint the teres major will also be a contributor. Also, I want to point out long head of the triceps. So the triceps brachii is a weak shoulder extensor, and that should also can be added in there because it does extend. Sometimes when you're doing, let's say, lat pulls, and we'll say in the sagittal plane, so doing extension, and even though you're doing bicep flexion, you're like, man, I feel it in my triceps. It's crazy because my triceps aren't working. Your triceps are working. Not only is there a co-contraction of the tricep to stabilize things, but also the tricep is actively contributing to the extension of the shoulder. So that is a contributor. Great. So now moving on to the next two joint actions, we've got internal rotation and external rotation, sometimes referred to as medial and lateral rotation. So internal or medial rotation defined as rotation toward the midline along the vertical axis, meaning uh, in the transverse or horizontal plane. Normal range of motion is going to be 70 to 90 degrees. I'm in, I'm with you on that. And the internal rotation muscles. Are you ready? Here we go. The subscapularis, subscapularis, which is the only one of the rotator cuff muscles that is an internal or medial rotator. Otherwise, you got pec major. You've got the latissimus dorsi. Whoa, Rick, are you sure? The pecs and the lats are opposing muscles, right? Mm. Y'all, the pecs and the lats have a lot more in common than they have in opposition. Uh, one example of that would be the internal rotation of this right here. So we also talked to... Uh, well, internal rotation at the shoulder. We'll talk a little bit more when it comes to another joint action as we continue to go through it, not opposing. So pec major is an internal rotator, the um, latissimus dorsi, and then the teres major. If the lats do it at the shoulder joint, then so does the lats little brother. Brothers got a hug. So the teres major will be a component. And we can also put in there the anterior aspect of the deltoid because I think we should point out the anterior deltoid can also internally or medially rotate. All right, so there we are. Internal rotator, subscapularis, pec major, lats, teres major, and anterior delts. Let's move on to external rotation of the shoulder defined as rotating away from the midline along the vertical, vertical axis. So we rotate along that horizontal plane. Normal range of motion is going to be 90 degrees of external rotation. Mostly, primarily, your movers in external rotation are the infraspinatus and the teres minor. Now, we've been talking about teres major. Teres major is an internal rotator. The teres minor is a lateral or external rotator. Also, you can put in there that the posterior delts will contribute to it. But now, here's what I want you to think about. 
did you notice? Did you notice the size of the muscles that do internal rotation versus the size of the muscles that do external or lateral rotation? It, it's pretty significant, in fact. You the pecs and the lats and the teres major and the subscapularis and the anterior deltoid, even your anterior deltoid versus the posterior deltoid. We got five muscles that are contributing internal rotation, and we've got two, three small muscles that do lateral rotation. We've got the infraspinatus and teres minor, which are both relatively small rotator cuff muscles that are the only two really that laterally rotate the, the humerus. And then the posterior deltoid, which is certainly much weaker than its anterior partner. It, no wonder people are internally rotated. No wonder people tend to go into internal rotation. And I think this is a good reason to point out why we learn what muscles do is so that we can address these situations. We say, I'm really overdeveloping my anterior and internal rotating muscle. I can't say anterior because half of those monetaries major and the lats are posterior muscles, but rotate internally. So here we are trying to find balance in the force. And yet we think because we're doing a push-pull routine, we're balancing out our pecs and our lats. But if we're doing pecs a day, pec a day and a lat day, we're not actually balancing out what's going on at the shoulder joint. So as much as we like to think that we're balancing, we're not. So I say when you talk about balance, you wonder about balance, think about balancing movement in a plane of motion, balancing the movement in a plane of motion, not trying to balance out muscles, balance out movement. And when you balance movement, the corresponding muscles will therefore be balanced out. Good. All right. Let's move on. We got two more joint actions to consider. We have adduction and abduction, adduction at the shoulder and abduction. So let's go adduction, bringing them arms down, defined as bringing the upper limbs toward the midline of the body. Let's say the arms are overhead and we are pulling them down, but this takes place in the frontal or coronal plane, the frontal plane, adduction, bringing the arms closer to the midline of the body. All right, well, muscles primarily responsible for adduction, adduction, ad, bringing together pec major, lats, and guess who? If the lats do it at the shoulder, who else? You got it, Terry's major. Wait, wait, I thought, again, pecs and lats were opposing muscle groups. No, no, no. Pecs have just as much, sometimes more in common when it comes to joint actions than they have in opposition. So I think it's important to point out this so that we better understand human movement and we better understand balance when we're programming. So let's look at the last one here, abduction, abduction, being taken away. You are abducted by aliens in the middle of a cornfield somewhere. You are taken away is what that means. And then when they add you back to the population, you are a pariah because nobody believes you. Nobody believes. Abduction, taken away. Limbs move away from the midline of the body in what plane? Frontal or, give me another one, coronal. Coronal, that's right. Uh, coronal plane, it is normal range of motion, 150 degrees, due to the ability to differentiate. Now, this is what the author's saying. I think it's important. The ability to differentiate, differentiate several pathologies by range of motion of the glenohumeral joint. Chang and his, his co-authors go on to say, when the glenohumeral joint in this plane, which is the frontal plane or coronal plane, it's essential to understand how different muscles contribute to this action. What action? Abduction, the movement of the arms away from the body in the frontal plane. They say, number one, here we go, supraspinatus is responsible for the first zero to 15 degrees of abduction. So the very first, the initiation of abduction is going to be the supraspinatus. You may be familiar with this muscle, supraspinatus nodus, spinatus spinatus. 
tomato, tomato. Either, either. I say, I say either and neither, but I've noticed, I've noticed a lot of people are either in and neither in. I don't like it. I don't like it. Moving on. Super spinatus spinatus. The first zero to 15 degrees of abduction come from that one rotator cuff muscle. Now, the second part of that movement, as you go on to 15 degrees to about 90 degrees of abduction, is going to be the middle fibers of the deltoids. The middle fibers moving from about 15 degrees to 90 degrees. But as you continue to go up, if you stay strict in the um, the the frontal plane, if you stay strict, the rest of that movement, and I don't change my shoulder position, the rest of that movement is going to be upward rotation because I basically run out of room if I keep my palms down and just go in the abduction as far as possible. However, if I bend my elbows and I turn my hands up like a shoulder press, well, now I can get my arm, hopefully, all the way overhead. And that, in addition to the upward rotators of the scapula, will also be the anterior delt. So if I stay in the plane, stay strict in the plane, arms out straight, palms down, 15 to 90 degrees is going to be uh, the middle delt. If I keep moving without shifting my shoulders at all, then it's going to be upward rotation. But if I go into the shoulder press position, then that's going to be primarily the anterior delt, along with the upward rotators of the scapula that get the arm there. All right. Y'all, those are some muscles that move the shoulder. Specifically, when I say shoulder, the glenohumeral joint. Thank you for listening. Like, subscribe, share with your fitness friends and family, and consider listening to it again. Listening to the podcast again and trying to get some of these muscles down, trying to get some of these movements down. And the reason it's important, for instance, if I have a hard time putting my arms all the way overhead, it might be because the muscles that pull my arms down are tight. It might also be a combination of those muscles are tight and the muscles that move my arm overhead, flexion or abduction, are weak. And you go back to the previous episode with upward rotation of the scapula, same thing. I might be stuck in downward rotation of the scapula and I can't go into upward rotation. So my upward rotators might be weak, but my downward rotators of the scapula might be short, tight, overactive, and need to be addressed. Once I do some releases, release, I'm going to say once I maybe foam roll or do some uh, massage where I just get ischemic pressure is what I tend to do, which is just find a spot sometimes with my hand and just dig my finger into it and hold it there, hold it in that position. I feel that in my jaw and a little bit in my ear and my eyeball just pushing right here on this spot. That is, um, it's called trigger point. That is a referred pain somewhere else. So I have a trigger point there in my um, levator scapula that I was just pushing on. So that is a downward rotator of the scapula. So I can release that, I can stretch that, and then I can move. Same thing, I want it, the reason we learn muscles, understand movement, the reason we understand movement is if we want to get certain types of movement. We think we can help people get there. I need to know what to stretch and what to strengthen. And that's why these are important. Hope you're well. Keep inspiring people to fitness. Thanks for listening. Uh, oh, wait, you want to reach out to me? You can do so. Hit me up on Instagram at dr.rickritchie or on threads, or you can email me rick.ritchie at nasm.org. Here's the ending tag. Thanks for listening. This has been the NASM CPT Podcast.